This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to Tao Unbound. I'm Ido Aroni, your host, and today it's my pleasure to host two leaders of Tel Aviv University, Vice President in Charge of International Affairs, Professor Mila Chamir. Hello, Ido. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you. And uh, Vice President in Charge of Equity, Diversity, and Community, and also a member of the Faculty of Law, Professor Neta Ziv. Welcome. Hello. Such Thank a pleasure to host you both here. I'm glad to be here. And, uh, and to hear, really, educate ourselves on what's happening in Tel Aviv University when it comes to the promotion and the enhancement of diversity and inclusion, and how that fits into the work that we do um, internationally, because Tel Aviv University is one of the uh, premier universities we have in the state of Israel and has certainly a very solid and very firm international standing, not only academically, but also culturally and socially. And I would even say nowadays probably politically because the voices coming out of Tel Aviv University are being echoed all over the world. And so my first question, as usual, is always personal. Tell us a little bit about yourselves before we jump into the subject matter. So we'll start with you, Professor Mila Chamil. Uh, with pleasure. Um, the main thing I think I would like to share about myself is that my life has been entwined with Tel Aviv University for many, many decades um, because my father also worked here. I was a child who grew up on the lawns of uh, near the Gilman building. I was an undergraduate here. Uh, went on to get my graduate uh, degree in the States, but came back immediately after as a faculty member um, in English and American studies. So I have a very, very uh, deep uh, relation, and uh, Tel Aviv University is a big part of, uh, of my identity and who I am. And today I serve as Vice President for International Collaborations, which uh, allows me to give back to the university by uh, promoting its standing, its connections, its uh, its visibility, its impact worldwide. And, and we should also mention that Tel Aviv University, when it comes to the number of students on campus, is the largest university in Israel. That's right. It's the largest university. It also has uh, the most international students. And I think uh, it's a leading university in terms of international research collaborations as well in Israel. And, and Professor Ziv, tell us a little bit, a bit about your background. So I grew up in Rehovot. Both my parents were scientists, actually, in the hard sciences. Uh, but I kind of took to law and went to Hebrew University. I'm not a graduate of this university, to study law. And after my graduation, I practiced as a lawyer for 10 years. I decided to be a public interest lawyer. Uh, I worked for a nonprofit and basically dedicated the first uh, decade of my uh, professional career to doing uh, Supreme Court litigation on civil rights, gender, minorities. So I kind of led myself to the track of uh, public interest and social justice legal work. And then after 10 years, I went to the United States to do my doctorate and came back to Tel Aviv University, which uh, took me with open arms to set up uh, legal clinics uh, at the law school. The first legal clinics were established at Tel Aviv University. This is a program in which uh, faculty and students provide legal services, free legal services to disadvantaged uh, communities. So this is what I did for about 15 years. And uh, about a year and a half ago, um, the president uh, approached me and asked me to set up a new unit at TAU, which is responsible for equity and diversity, and the community came later. And this is what I'm doing today, and I'll be happy to share uh, what we do here. Yeah, so first I have a question um, to you, Professor Shamir. We have, we know, uh, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm, my experience is the United States. I'm not an expert on Europe, not an expert on any other part of the world. In the United States, I know, there are 5,500 universities and colleges. There are between 21 to 23 million students any given moment. And we know that about 750,000 750, to 1 million students, American students, travel abroad every year to study for 10 days, a month, sometimes six months, sometimes a full year, 
the programs vary. And we also know that at least 10% of them are Jewish, if not more. And the question begs, what can we do to attract more of them to come to study Tel Aviv U and in Israel in general? Because I know that the numbers are, are really, uh, we're underperforming severely on that international front. Uh, it's a good question. It's a very focused one. And if you will allow me, though, I would, um, I would broaden the context for your question for a second uh, before we think specifically about study abroad or a specific kind of student who we want to bring here uh, from the States or other places. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, realize that the whole phenomenon of study abroad or of exchange students or of professor moving from university to university is an essential component. It's almost in the DNA of a research university. You can't imagine quality research universities without this international mobility. And that has always been true since the oldest universities. I think that uh, the study abroad uh, website always cites that the first international study abroad student was in 1100, uh, a student from North uh, the Netherlands who came to England and studied there uh, at Oxford. So th this idea of knowledge traveling and people traveling with knowledge in order to produce new knowledge in an in international encounter is part and parcel of what an institution devoted to uh, the creation and the betterment of knowledge uh, is all about. Think Hamlet, right? I'm in, in American studies. I'm a literature professor. Hamlet was an exchange student in Germany before he came back to deal with his family problems. Um, so it's always been very important to have students travel and uh, to have professors travel. I think this has picked up momentum very significantly in the 1990s for a variety of reasons. Uh, globalization, uh, the appearance of digital uh, culture and digital technology, um, the uh, end of the Cold War, the creation of the European Union. You know, all these things gave a huge boost to this idea that as part and parcel of every student's education, on any level, undergraduate, graduate, uh, you name it, uh, part of par and parcel of that uh, uh, education has to be significant time spent in another cultural or national uh, setting. And that's when universities really entered a kind of a, a, a strategic, uh, um, strategic thinking and dedication of resources to creating in each university, in each university that considers itself a good, a good research university, opportunities for students to come and spend time here. And this is also where Israel began to hold study abroad programs. Uh, at Tel Aviv University, we've had one for several decades now, but it has really grown in the past uh, decade and a half uh, or so. Um, before COVID, we brought around 400 students a year on the study abroad program uh, from many places in the world, largely from the United States. As you mentioned, it's a, it's a big, uh, Israel is a, is a big destination for many uh, American students, by the way, Jewish and non-Jewish. Um, COVID has introduced a little bit of a slump, uh, but we're now emerging back and kind of rethinking what it means to be here in post-COVID world. Uh, what it means to teach international students with all the new technologies that have become available. And I think we're seeing a, a very nice uh, rise uh, of international students uh, already this year and uh, towards the next. And I might, and I might say as a, as a visiting lecturer at the, the Kohler School of Management that it's uh, such a delight to have students from all over the world in my class. I've had students from Mexico, from um, Canada, and most of them were not Jewish. They just came to experience Israel and to experience Tel Aviv, and uh, it was such a such a delight. And I'm still in touch with some of them. And um, well, that's that's a that's I think a beautiful vision uh, for the future. And I believe that Tel Aviv is primed. Tel Aviv University is primed really to capitalize on that on that potential. Um, and and I'm curious, Professor Ziv, to hear from you. Um, so what are the main challenges? So we have this massive student body. We have this massive potential because we are in Tel Aviv, right? Tel Aviv is the hub of creativity, the hub of knowledge, the hub of business, the hub of culture. What are the main challenges when you try to introduce diversity and inclusion and equity and community? So um, I will answer your question by connecting to uh, some of Millet's uh, themes. Um, 
and how diversity and international internationality are, are connected. And they're connected in different ways. Uh, the first is um, Tel Aviv is a global university in the sense that it's looking at other universities outside the world and what are they are doing they are doing. And uh, in the last uh, decade and even more, we have seen that all universities in the United States, also in uh, Europe, have looked at the issue of diversity as one of their missions. Okay, so, so they are looking at themselves as institutions of civil society and ask themselves, uh, what are our duties uh, in, in, in our democratic society, in our liberal society, in the society that we live in? And we too um, at Tel Aviv University have begun asking ourselves these questions quite a while ago, but now institutionalizing it into a formal structure. So, so one way of understanding why diversity is because we are a public institution. We are an elite institution. We want to bring in students from all over the world, also from all over Israel, and I'll get to that in a minute. But if we want international students to see, to have an experience in Israel, we want them to see all Israel, all Israel in, in the academia. And unless uh, Tel Aviv University is representative of the different groups that live here, study here, work here, uh, their experience will not be complete. So uh, the mission is tied into um, who we are and who we want to, um, how do we want the world to perceive us? Now, when, when we look at the, the, the mission of diversity with it, within Israel itself, I, I think the, the, the thing that we should start um, with is the fact that in Israel, uh, we live in segregated spheres. Um, Arabs and Jews do not live in the same towns, most of them. Their kids do not go to the same schools. They do not study in the same language. The ultra-Orthodox and the secular usually live in different neighborhoods, go to different school systems, study, dif study different subjects. We have um, the periphery, uh, you know, students coming from um, what we call development towns or, or disadvantaged uh, locations. And some go to the army, some don't go to the army, the Arabs don't go to the army, the ultra-Orthodox don't go to the army. So the army is not the melting pot of Israeli society. And the place that can start to look at Israel and bring together all the groups is the academia. And this is the first place sometimes that a Jew meets an Arab, that an ultra-Orthodox woman meets a secular woman, that an ultra-Orthodox woman meets an ultra-Orthodox Muslim woman. Because all their lives they have lived in different spheres. So our mission is really to be the place where we can create a shared space for all cultures, for people from all over the world, from people from all over Israel, to share our quest for knowledge and for learning. And I think this is, uh, uh, especially these days, this can be a place for hope uh, to show that we can live together here uh, all groups in Israeli society. So I view the mission of, of diversity and equity as a big mission. It's not, it's not just, okay, how many students from each group we have, but how do we really create a place that is um, shared and that everybody feels that they belong here? So this is the big mission. We now, can talk about how we do that. Yeah, I'm but, interested but, in hearing about the actual practice of how yeah. do we do that. But before that, I'm, I'm curious about that um, because when I tell my, my American students, and I also teach at NYU, which is a private university, and I tell them what's the tuition in Israel, they're blown away, right? So for our listeners to hear, the tuition in Israel is about one-tenth, if not one-twentieth of what is the tuition in any private university in the United States or, or for that matter, in, in other parts of the world. Is the tuition a barrier for diversity? The tuition can be a barrier for diversity. Uh, we have to remember that for Israeli students, even though the tuition, is, obviously the tuition is less than the elite universities in the United States because the distortion is there, not here. Okay, uh, It should not be too, so expensive that you know, uh, a young American from the 
a southern state would not be able to study in an American university. So I think our tuition is, it's low and it's good that it is low. Nevertheless, many of our students, most of those who come after they served in the army, so they're already in their early 20s, some of them in their mid 20s, uh, they need to work to provide for themselves. And um, therefore, for, for many uh, who do not come from families who can support them financially, even paying the $4,000 or $4,000 of tuition and their living expenses and housing in Tel Aviv, which is really, really expensive, could be a barrier for coming to study at Tel Aviv. So it's not just tuition, it's the whole package of living here, which is quite expensive. Yes, yes. And, and it used to be also, when I was a student here in the early 1980s, it was like that too. Uh, it wasn't, uh, Tel Aviv wasn't as expensive as it is today, but it wasn't easy. I had to work, you know, I had two jobs. And when I studied, Professor Shamir, without going into specific um, names or naming any institutions, how would you compare Israel, the Tel Aviv University to what's happening in the international uh, sphere when it comes to efforts in the area of, of diversity and inclusion? And uh, diversity and inclusion, again, I will defer to Neta when it comes to what we can call internal or Israeli diversity and inclusion, although... As Neta was pointing out, uh, the two, uh, our two separate projects come together in many ways, including, for example, around LGBTQ um, students who come from abroad because they know that Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv University is a place where they can find a home and, you know, that they, they are attracted to the kind of uh, pluralism and, uh, uh, and openness of uh, our Tel Aviv University campus. So there are a lot of uh, connections. Um, I think, uh, you know, Neta is better qualified to talk about uh, the specific efforts of American universities when it comes to uh, diversity or universities elsewhere. What I can say is that international diversity um, is uh, achieved differently and with varying uh, success in different parts of the world. The Europeans, of course, lead the way. Uh, because of the European Union and its programs, Erasmus and the other programs that make mobility very easy because they all work under the same accreditation system and a student can just pick up and go and, you know, to a different country and spend a semester there with very little consequences academically in terms of uh, losing hours or things like that. So the Europeans are really a model for all of us. I think uh, Americans uh, uh, have developed several different and interesting uh, models. Um, some of them are very successful. You work at NYU, so you know that NYU's model has been to open uh, campuses around the world, uh, including here in Tel Aviv, where they can send their students uh, for a semester abroad, and that's one kind of a model. Um, Columbia, their competitor from the other side of uh, New York City, mm -hmm. has developed a slightly different model, which is to create uh, dual degree programs with leading institutions around the world. So Tel Aviv University has a joint BA program with Columbia University. Instead of Columbia students coming here to study at a branch of Columbia University in Tel Aviv, which would kind of leave them still within the world of Columbia, uh, Columbia thinks that internationalization is better served when the students actually study at another institution that is local, that has a different academic culture, uh, that have, you know, that where they meet students who are not American, but uh, Israeli. And uh, so this model for us is very, very appealing because it allows, I think, for us to create not just for international students, but also for the Israeli students, an experience of true diversity within uh, their BA education. Um, and maybe that's also the place to, to mention that a, a, a large part of internationalization, you know, we, we always think about the students that we bring here and how important that is, but that mission is inseparable from our, our mission uh, when it comes to the Israeli students. Uh, we feel, and um, I know that I share this with many people from around Israel, uh, including recently the Malag that has put a lot of emphasis, the Council of Higher Education, on this aspect of internationalization, that it is the duty of the university to prepare the students for a life as citizens of the world, as holding careers that are global careers and not local, and that as part of the toolbox that we give our students, we need to equip them with, um, with uh, capacities, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the ability 
uh, to communicate with other cultures. This means language study. It means offering courses in English uh, in a larger scale. But it also means how we think about our own curriculum. How do we make sure that within our courses, we internationalize the very material that the students uh, are exposed to? So that not all examples are Israeli examples, that a comparative perspective uh, between different cultures and different nations uh, is pursued in the classroom, that students think you know, in a much wider uh, uh, frame of reference than simply the local frame of reference. And that, and that becomes all the more important now when we see this global pushback against the, the implications and the ramifications of technical and technological interconnectedness which is a, a major boost uh, for globalization. And we see this pushback all over the world, this, this uh, populist message that, um, you know, and I think it was fueled by the reaction of people to COVID-19. The pandemic also was a little, little bit of a setback. So that becomes really important. Uh, Professor Ziv, before we started uh, the, the broadcast, we spoke a little bit about the tension between, you know, how do you enhance diversity and, uh, and inclusion? And, and academic excellence. If you could tell us a little bit about that and also about what we're doing practically okay. to enhance that. Um, so um, just as uh, uh, internationalizing um, our classes and diversifying the uh, curriculum and the examples in the class and exposing our students to different cultures uh, outside of Israel, uh, the same can very often be said to students in Israel. Um, see, th th there, there's a popular saying that diversity often comes uh, on account of excellence, i.e. that we have to lower our standards in order to be diverse. And this is completely not true. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I just finished a class now, first year class. I'm teaching uh, a course on uh, legislation and regulation, a very hot topic these days. And we discuss different theories in the class about private and public and regulation. And I have Arab students in my class and I have ultra-Orthodox students in my class and I have women in my class and I have Mizrahi and Ashkenazi. Um, and no doubt that the discussion in the class is much richer and the perspectives are really more interesting because the students bring whoever they are into the class and they bring in the examples and they had tell us what is, you know, oh, I remember that I was told by my grandmother this and that. So, so I feel that teaching in a diverse class uh, really raises the bar, really raises the, the level of discussion and not just exposing other students to different culture and opening kind of the horizons, but also actually doing pure academic work. And um, in my class, I have three TAs. One is a, a Orthodox man. Uh, the other is a woman with a disability. And the other one is an Arab uh, uh, young uh, graduate of ours. And, and just to have the class see uh, that these are the, the three, the staff that is teaching with me in the class, I think creates a model that, that as I said before, this is excellence, but this is also uh, Israeli society. This is, you know, how, how, we, can, how we can do it. So I, I think that um, the, the, the tension, the seeming tension between excellence and diversity is, is wrong because we are used to... Um, testing our students for excellence according to a certain way. We have these standardized tests uh, according to which we measure their certain grade, and hopefully this is an indicator for uh, academic excellence. But we know that uh, many of these standardized tests are culturally biased. Uh, for an ultra-Orthodox student that didn't study in a high school but went to a yeshiva, I cannot test him for potential academic excellence as I test someone else. Uh, an Ethiopian student that whose uh, background in the family did not prepare them with the kind of knowledge, broader knowledge that is tested, will score a much lower grade, but that doesn't mean that they necessarily will be a weaker student. Same to be said about our Arab students that have to study Arabic, 
spoken Arabic, written Arabic, Hebrew, English. So obviously they come in with a disadvantage in terms of how we test them. So, so first of all, we have to look at our student body and to see how we can do an outreach and an adaptation of the way that we measure potential excellence really to create a balanced level, uh, level field. So, um, so this is one of the things that we do. We look very critically at the ways we admit students in order to make sure, and, and also outreach to students that don't even think of Tel Aviv University as a place where they can come to study because it's, it's too far away, it's too expensive, it's too elite. So we have a duty to, tr to try to attract these students and to make sure that they have an equal opportunity to enter and then to support them when they are here. What do we do about the elements that we don't control? For example, the psychometric, what they call psychometric t tests, testing in Israel, which is a whole industry, which I'm not sure has any predictability as to academic excellence. I have to tell you, I, I went, when I went to study in the United States, they forced me to take a test um, called the GRE, uh, which was, um, uh, became a nightmare for me especially the analytical part. And then I, I did some reading about it because I studied sociology. It turns out GRE has very little to do with predicting academic success. So, uh, right on, because this is exactly what I'm trying to tackle right now. Uh, we do have some admission tracks that do not abide by the strict uh, GRE, or here it's called the psychometric and, uh, you know, we're trying to broaden them, to broaden these uh, admit, admission tracks that would not rely so strongly on the psychometric exam or that would bypass them. So we have quite a few tracks in which we try to, to adapt our requirements to the background of the student that is coming. And let me just give you a couple of examples. So our students from the law school, the, law, the, the school that I come from, when we decided that we want to admit um, uh, students that are ultra-Orthodox, that studied in ultra-Orthodox institutions, uh, we decided that we're not going to look at the math component of the psychometric. Because in law, it doesn't really matter how you did in math. If he wanted to study physics or engineering, probably they would look at the math. But in the law school, we decided to kind of uh, uh, adapt the, the, the requirements to this student. If we have students that are coming in from the Ethiopian community, we look completely different, differently at their achievement. We look at other things. We don't look only at the psychometric because we understand that it is culturally biased. For our Arab students, we support them in the Hebrew speaking component and they do get in on a regular track. There's no affirmative action or, or no special admissions to our Arab students, but when they enter, we have to provide them enforcement of their Hebrew language skills. So it's not a one-size-fits-all solution in order to diversify. It's kind of handmade, very gentle ways in which we try to accommodate the uh, kind of this, this mass production of students entering to the specifics of the groups that we want to attract and that are underrepresented here. Well, Professor Shamir, I wanted to ask you about Tel Aviv University's web of international connections. So we know we're very strong in North America. We're strong in Europe. Uh, what can you teach us about the international connectedness of Tel Aviv University with the rest of the world? Uh, so here, I think we're moving a little bit into a discussion about research connections as opposed to student mobility, which has been our focus uh, earlier. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty astounding experience uh, that I had moving from my academic home, which is a faculty of humanities, to a panoramic view of the entire university to realize what uh, an impressive array of connections on every level the university has. Almost every researcher at the university has at least five, six connections in different places in the world. Some of them have hundreds. And to see this huge map, a uh, global map of connections between our faculty and people around the world is truly uh, an amazing experience. And it's very important because one of the places where I think Israeli universities still do not excel 
is in understanding how important uh, collaborative publications are. Um, not just because of what we've spoken about before, which is that, you know, I think both Neta and I are very firm believers that, you know, when you put together two researchers who come from different backgrounds and different cultures, different ways of doing research, sparks will fly, but also simply because of what happens to an article that is published through a collaborative effort. It gets, some say, twice the exposure. A study in the UK has said four or five times the exposure of a single authored or single national uh, publication. And so this research uh, network that the university is developing and that we are trying to, you know, as much as we can uh, uh, facilitate uh, through the university's uh, leadership by allowing our researchers to build these networks as much as we can is really crucial for not just for the, uh, for the you know, it, it, as an end in itself, but as a basic uh, component of how our research can have global impact. Um, but I will say that other than this very, very wide network that comes from the grassroots, from the researchers themselves, the university does define specific strategic partners in places around the world with whom we have a, a, a tighter and more um, comprehensive uh, relation where we invest a lot of our international funding uh, to have promote and nurture this relationship. So we're talking about universities like Columbia that I've already mentioned, uh, Northwestern. In Europe, we have very close connections with uh, LMU, the University of Munich, uh, with the University of Frankfurt, with Manchester in England. So there are specific universities with whom we have um, a, a relationship that transcends a single discipline or a single research project, but really crosses across all disciplines and all, uh, and all uh, areas of study uh, that the universities have uh, in common. Now, we're running out of time, so I'd like to end with the uh, 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 same question for both of you because we have um, on our database tens of thousands of people that belong to either the friends of the university globally or people that are connected to the university as alumni or relatives of alumni. I mean, we have a very vast network. And my question to you is, um, what can they do, the people that are listening to us right now, to enhance those both, both things that we discussed today? On the one hand, diversity and inclusion, and on the other hand, the international, the international nature of Tel Aviv University. How can we boost that together with our friends globally? We'll start with you, Professor Ziv. So... I think um, it, it's hard to answer this question without relating a little bit to what's happening outside the university and the times that we are facing. And um, we have to remember that uh, an open, independent, autonomous university that can decide on issues like internationalization and academic excellence and diversity it is a pillar of our democracy. And um, there's no democracy without academia and there's no academia without democracy. So uh, we need to, first of all, uh, send out the message that um, within, within these hard times, uh, Tel Aviv University is a stronghold for democracy. And um, as I started and said, uh, this is a place where we can, on the one hand, um, uh, insist on our, our academic independence and our in integrity uh, as an institution of a liberal democracy, but at the same time show uh, the world um, another uh, way that Israel can uh, and, and hopefully will uh, survive as a um, Jewish and democratic and a liberal state with strong institutions, the academy uh, being first uh, and foremost uh, one of its uh, one of its central pillars. So this is a message that I would like to send um, that uh, this is something that is discussed at the university on all levels among students, among faculty, among our leadership at the university. And it's, um, it's, it's a time in which we're all, you know, looking on the one hand, uh, 
with concern, but uh, with hope. And I, I couldn't agree more because, you know, I always um, see Tel Aviv University as like the Israeli twin of, of New York University because of the relationship between the, the university and the city. And Tel Aviv is the cradle of, uh, of the modern state of Israel. That's where the proclamation of independence was made. It's the first Hebrew city, 1909. I'm proud to say that my family was one of the founding families of Tel Aviv. Um, and, uh, and NYU, of course, has a very strong connection to Tel Aviv U. And New York has a very strong connection to the city of Tel Aviv. Many of my friends, when they come to um, Israel, they're surprised to see the sign on the highway in Tel Aviv, LaGuardia. And they ask me, why do you have a bridge named after Mayor LaGuardia? And I have to tell them about his role helping the Haganah uh, back in the early 1940s in New York. Um, uh, Professor Shamir, how can our audience be of help to you in your work? Yeah, I just have to connect for a second with what Nedo was saying because it's so important also to locate our conversation in a specific moment uh, and in what's going on with Israel. And I just want to throw out a, a, a short anecdote um, that also connects with our conversation earlier. The international students who are currently here, and there are hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, feel a little bit confused by what's going on. You know, the, the, the legal debate is not very clear to someone who doesn't know the system well. You know, thousands and thousands of people are marching on the streets. Uh, you know, the, things at the university don't run as, uh, as normal. So we had a little get together for the international students to try to explain to them what's going on. And in that audience of a few dozens, uh, there were students from Russia. There were students from Turkey. There were students from the U.S. There were students from China. And each one of them, uh, who we thought would be a passive listener to our uh, discussion or to our presentation of what's going on here, had so much to say about what happened in his or her own country in why it's a little bit problematic to, uh, to compare between the nomination of judges in the U.S. and in Israel. They brought so much valuable insight and knowledge to the conversation that to me, it really um, uh, brought home the realization that at exactly at moments like this, we need this international community. We need the perspectives. We need the support. We need the, the comparison. We need the lessons learned in other places uh, to help us. And we also need to bring out that message that Netta was uh, uh, said, uh, you know, so eloquently of Tel Aviv University's role in uh, in providing uh, a quality, uh, knowledgeable analysis of the situation, uh, and uh, providing a hub for dialogue and for discussion and for um, and for perspective. Um, so I'm definitely connecting with that. Um, but that put aside, you know, there's always, always room for our international community of friends and, and alumni uh, to help our efforts, uh, both internally and in terms of internationalization, whether by letting people, you know, their kids know about the opportunities to study here or their kids' friends, or by uh, accepting our students on an internship in their companies, or by, you know, those who are involved in academic life by seeing how we can strengthen this network of research relations that we're building here at the university. There are endless ways to build on, on our community globally uh, in order to uh, better Tel Aviv University and its impact around the world. And, and I think that what I'm hearing from both of you is, um, and I say this to our viewers and our listeners, and many of them reached out to me and they're very upset what's happening now in Israel and they consider this engaging. Well, you, you hear it from the leaders of the university. This is exactly the time to engage even more forcefully. Thank you so much for being here. It's a real pleasure. And uh, you make me proud as a graduate that we have such wonderful leaders at Tel Aviv University. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ido. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Neta. Thank you, Milet. <laughs> this is Tau Unbound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomats.